changing rooms, of course, for this. Come on in, grab some lunch, and have a seat. So um, today, today we are going to do two things. The first is we are going to hear from the leader, uh, Michelle Welsh, who is an Department of Business Law and Taxation at Monash University. And she is going to speak to, Mary, you can come in and just sit there. Thank you. Um, she is going to speak to a paper entitled Considerations of Fairness and Conflicts of Interest in the Regulation of Financial Markets. And we've spoken about, um, in a few past that we've had so far, spoken about fairness and conflicts of interest um, in, uh, in capital markets. And both are really, really important themes um, because they, you know, fairness relates to the concept of confidence in the markets, um, investor confidence as well as public confidence in the markets. And then conflicts of interest is an issue, of course, that uh, you know you have to figure out how to either avoid or manage when they arise. And it'll be great to hear uh, Michelle's uh, perspective on this. Her areas of focus are corporate law, corporate regulation, enforcement, and compliance. And so her talk also ties in really, really nicely with then the second half of class, which um, where um, Ali and Sydney will speak to uh, some of the readings, and uh, we'll have a discussion on public enforcement. So enforcement by public regulation. Regulators, what's why it's important, where the hot issues are in terms of um, challenges and difficulties, and how we might be able to address them. So that's the second half of the class. First part of class, we have uh, Dr. Michelle Welsh. Let's uh, give her a big round of applause, and I'll pass it over to her. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for coming along and um, listening to my presentation this afternoon. Um, and thank you, Poonam, for um, letting me interrupt your class and talk to you about um, this topic that I'm very interested in. I'll apologise in advance. I've been in the US for a week and a half now and I've had a cold the whole time I've been, not the US and, and Canada, um, had a cold the whole time I've been here. So um, if I'm coughing and spluttering a bit, I apologise for that, but um, hopefully you'll be able to understand what I'm saying. Um, so I understand that um, you've been looking at corporate governance in this class and I had a little bit of a look at the, um, the syllabus and things that you've done so far. And before I start talking about regulation and public regulation in financial markets, I just wanted to briefly tell you something about um, regulation of corporate governance in Australia generally because um, we have a, a system that's quite different to um, a lot of other places I'm discovering as I move around. And I just thought I might briefly mention it to you because I think it is quite interesting when you're thinking about uh, public enforcement and private enforcement. Um, and specifically, I, I saw in your reading guide that you've talked a little bit about director's duties already as part of a corporate governance um, a course and uh, did you talk anything about enforcement of directors' duties as such? Did so? Did have you spoken at all about enforcement of directors' duties in Not Canada? Specifically, yeah, so, um, so yeah, about yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the Canadian situation, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I know in the US enforcement is um, private enforcement. So the duties are owed to the company, so the uh, party that normally takes enforcement action will be the company against the directors. So it's a private action. Or um, it could be shareholders under what's called a derivative suit can take action. There's no public enforcement of directors' duties in the US, nor in Canada. Is that right? Nor in Canada officially. Sometimes securities regulators, in their decisions, will start speaking of <coughs> directors' duties, but they don't really have the uh, authority or the mandate to do so. Yeah. And um, in the UK, there's no public enforcement. In Australia, we've had public enforcement of directors' duties since 1958. Um, and we have a national corporate regulator in Australia that has the power to take both criminal and civil enforcement for breaches of statutory director's duties. So our duties are in our act and the regulator, if it wants to, can take enforcement action um, and it can ask for a range of different penalties, including fines, disqualification orders or bans for directors and compensation. So Australia is quite unique in that um, a publicly funded regulator can seek compensation on behalf of a company if there's been director's duty breaches. 
And these provisions have been used reasonably frequently and in very large high profile cases. So where you've got big corporate collapses, you'll often see the regulator come in and take public enforcement action in the public interest um, on the basis of breaches of, dire of directors' duties. And that's quite unusual. They've also in recent years been running cases where they're able to say the company has breached a certain provision of the Act. Let's say the company hasn't disclosed information it should have and the directors have breached their duty because they've exposed the company to the risk of legal liability. So it's a way of extending directors' duties even further um, by saying that directors can be personally liable and can be banned, liable for compensation and fines um, if they allow the company or expose the company to the potential of being liable for breach of another provision of the Act. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because that's an interesting aspect of of public enforcement and seems to be quite a large step from where other jurisdictions are prepared to allow public enforcement to go. But today I really wanted to talk to you about this um, uh, paper I've written, it's just coming out as a book chapter later this month, um, on considerations of fairness and conflicts of interest in the regulation of financial markets. And what I'm going to be talking about basically today is what, or the crux of it is, what is the role of public regulation and is it um, to protect the markets generally and to promote integrity in the markets or is it to gain some sort of remedy for um, investors that may have lost as a result of a current contravention of the Act? So that's basically what I'm going to be talking about today. If I was talking about this in Australia, I could also be talking about breach of directors' duties, not just financial markets breaches, because we have this public regulation um, of our directors' duties. So I could be talking to you about, is it appropriate that the regulator can seek compensation on behalf of companies if the directors have breached the duty that they owe to the company? So that would be an issue that we would talk about in Australia, but wouldn't really be very relevant um, here in Canada. Okay, so... Um, the next slide is just a copy of the cover of the book that's coming out next month and that's where the, the um, book chapter will be appearing. There are a number of different chapters in this book that talk about fairness generally um, in financial markets. Um, there's a chapter by Professor Mary Condon who's a professor here in this, in this um, book. A lot of the chapters in the book talk about the rules that should govern financial markets in order to promote fairness. So um, they talk about what do we mean by fairness in financial markets. And the sort of issues that are, are raised by commentators who talk about this is that there should be rules in place not to ensure that nobody suffers any loss. We don't need rules in our financial markets to prevent losses. That's not what it's all about. It's more about making sure that the participants are playing in a level playing field. So it's like sport, if you like. Some commentators equate it with sport. You always get winners and losers in sport, but it's important that the rules are there to make sure that everyone plays fairly. So the types of rules that people say we need to govern our financial markets are things like disclosure of information, um, rules pro uh, prohibiting misleading and deceptive conduct, um, insider trading, things like that. So rules that promote fairness in the way that the market is operated, not rules that mean that everybody comes out with an equal outcome at the end. That's not what I'm talking about. My main area of research is in public regulation. So I was asked to contribute to a workshop um, at, um, in Vancouver last year and then the papers from the workshop came out as this book and my paper was talking about issues of fairness in regulation. So not issues in fairness in the rules that you should have governing the markets but issues to do with fairness when you're talking about how market regulators should exercise their enforcement functions and how they should make um, their enforcement choices. So, in Australia we have the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, which is the same regulator that can take enforcement action in response to breach of directors' duties. That same regulator also looks after our enforcement 
of um, the rules that govern financial markets. And there are similar regulators around the world who are in different jurisdictions, if they're faced with an alleged breach of the financial services rules, have to make certain determinations about what they're going to do about that. So I was thinking about issues of fairness in that context. Um, how should regulators act fairly when they're determining, first of all, whether or not they should take enforcement action in a given circumstance? And if they then have the choice of more than one enforcement action, what type of enforcement action should they utilise? What's it, what is it appropriate um, or what type of enforcement mechanisms are appropriate for publicly funded regulators? So if we think now about this concept of fairness, um, there are a lot of people who write on fairness generally um, and some authors who also write on fairness in the context of um, corporate law and financial markets and regulation. And one that I found that was quite useful um, was Warren, who also has a chapter in this book that I was showing you before, and he talks generally about what fairness means. And one of the things he says is that to act fairly, um, that requires consideration to be given to the perspectives of others who are impacted by our actions. So. I then used that and thought about that in the context of a publicly funded regulator who has before it evidence of a suspected contravention of the financial services laws. So who then would be impacted by the decisions that that regulator would make when it was determining whether or not to instigate enforcement action and what type of action it would instigate? So I identified three different main types of people or, or entities that will be impacted by those decisions. And the first one obviously is the defendant, the potential defendant of the enforcement action. They're going to be impacted by the determinations that the regulator makes. Secondly, you've got investors who've suffered a loss. So the people who've put in their money who, that has now been lost as a result of the current contravention you're talking about. So we might be talking about a contravention of um, misleading and deceptive conduct provisions or a failure to disclose information that's then meant that investors has lost, have lost money. They're clearly going to be impacted by any determination that the regulator makes. And lastly, you've got the public interest, which I'll come back to and talk about that in a moment. So just quickly, I'll just talk about um, these three different people or entities that might be impacted by determinations that public regulators might make when they're thinking about these issues. And the first one, as I said, is potential defendants. Now, there's nothing tricky about this. Um, it's easy to understand that the interests of any potential defendant will be best served if the regulator determines that they'll adopt a lenient approach. Right, that's clearly the best outcome for potential investors. There are various reasons why a regular, regulator may decide to adopt a lenient approach when it's faced with any particular contravention. There might be little public interest in pursuing this particular action. It might have only been a minor breach, it may not have been serious, there may not have been much loss incurred. So there might be various reasons why they might not, say from a public interest point, there's much, um, much reason in pursuing it. Another reason from a public um, interest perspective might be that the conduct was very unusual and is not likely to be repeated. So if it's unusual conduct that's not likely to be repeated by other um, entities in the future, it's unlikely that the regulator is going to be very concerned about sending a deterrent message to the market. So that might be another public interest reason why um, the regulator might decide to adopt a lenient approach. Resource constraints, though, is going to be the main reason why regulators often adopt lenient approaches. They just, they're publicly funded and they just don't have enough money or resources or manpower to pursue every single action that comes before them. Um, I'm aware of research that's been done in Australia by um, a Professor Kingsford Smith who's looked at ASIC's enforcement of um, breaches of these types of provisions and she's done some empirical data collection and she argues that ASIC investigates less than 20% of any complaints that are made to it. So that's even getting to the investigation stage. 
I've done a presentation at ASIC where I was talking to enforcement officers and they told me that once something gets past the investigation stage and it comes further down the chain and they determine that there is a reasonable prospect of having a successful action, they really only generally run about one in 20. So it's very few enforcement actions get run simply because they don't have the resources to do it. So in a lot of cases, the regulator adopts a lenient approach simply because they haven't got enough money to do anything else. So how does fairness come in here? Well, you're going to be happy if you're one of the defendants that the action's not, you know, you, you, there's no action proceeded against you. But from a fairness perspective, what if you are one of the defendants who are chosen and the action is, goes, is proceeded against you? Um, there is evidence, um, and people who've studied regulation have looked at this, that regulators generally pick high profile defendants. They want the biggest bang for their buck. They can't run many actions, so they pick the high profile person that's going to generate a lot of publicity and then hopefully increase the deterrent effect of the action. So if you're that particular defendant, possibly you've got a fairness argument to say, well, you know, I'm being treated unfairly. Um, if you compare how I've been treated to other similar defendants who've committed similar breaches in similar circumstances and action wasn't pursued against them. Um, I don't know that I have too much sympathy for people like this, so if you know, they've really done the wrong thing. But that is one area where you can think of this from a perspective of fairness. And if you are looking at the impact on the person of the action of the regulator, so the impact on the defendants who are subject to enforcement action, um, they could argue from a, a fairness perspective that they're not being treated appropriately. I don't want to say anything more about potential defendants because that's not what I'm really interested in. What I'm really interested in talking to you about is the next two, which is investors who have suffered a loss and the public interest and the conflict that can arise between um, the, the interests of those two parties. So we'll move on to that, but we can talk more about defendants if you want to at the end. Okay, the second group of people who are going to be impacted by any determination the regulator makes as to which enforcement actions to take and what types of actions to take will be investors who've suffered a loss as a result of the contravention that is being pursued by the regulator. Um, so they are the one, they are, will have lost money and they will clearly hope that the regulator takes enforcement action that results in them receiving some sort of compensation. Now in Australia and in a number of other jurisdictions, the regulators can take action that results in compensation going to the investors who've suffered a loss. So that's clearly um, what the investors in this case are going to want. And in fact, many of these investors will expect that that is what is going to happen. The expectation that the regulator should be acting on behalf of investors can be heightened um, in situations where you have the regulator being the same body that licenses the financial services provider who's done the wrong thing. And that's the situation in Australia. ASIC issues licenses to financial services providers. If the financial services provider does the wrong thing, engages in misleading and deceptive conduct and investor suffers a loss, Often you see in media reports and things like that this expectation that the regulator failed because the breach occurred on their watch. They had um, licensed this person to operate, therefore it's the regulator's responsibility to take enforcement action on behalf of those individual investors and get compensation for them. That's sort of a generally ex ex accepted public belief, that that's the role of the regulator. Um, in Australia, we have compulsory superannuation contributions, so all employees have to pay money out of their wages into their compensation. Sometimes that compensation gets invested and is, well, it's always invested, but sometimes it's lost and there's been a breach of the financial services provisions that have resulted in that loss. There is even heightened expectations in those circumstances that the regulator should act on behalf of the investors and should be targeting their enforcement action at obtaining compensation for the investors who've lost money. So I think um, 
there are two questions we need to think about here. And the first one is whether or not it is appropriately for a, sorry, appropriate for a publicly funded regulator, so paid for by the taxpayer, to be empowered to seek compensation on behalf of investors who've lost money? And if the answer to that is yes, the second question is, should the interests of investors prevail over the interests of other stakeholders? And here I'm going to talk about the public interest as being the other stakeholder. Should obtaining compensation be the regulator's priority? So that's the main thing um, that I really um, look at in this particular chapter is those two questions. So I've given you really an outline of the arguments that people run in favour of allowing a publicly funded regulator to seek compensation on behalf of investors. The argument is stronger when that same regulator has licensed the party that's done the wrong thing. Um, it's also a strong argument when you're talking about people losing their life savings. So if you've got investors, particularly if it's your retirement income and it's been lost as a result of the breach of these provisions that the regulator is tasked to enforce, there's a strong argument there that the rate regulator should have the power to seek compensation. The arguments against it basically are, come or stem from the fact that these regulators are funded by the taxpayer. If you or I lose money as a result of a breach of contract, certainly in Australia and I don't know of anywhere else, there's no publicly funded regulator that will step in on our behalf and sue the other party for breach of contract. That's considered a private matter and if I want to sue for breach of contract and I'm able to do so, I can. But I can't rely on a publicly taxpayer funded regulator to step in on my behalf. So why then should we allow publicly funded regulators to take enforcement action that results in investors who've lost money um, receiving compensation? So that's the counter argument. Um, maybe we can talk about what you think about that um, towards the end, unless anyone's got any comments now that you want to... No? Okay, but in the, in the chapter I go through and look at all those different arguments and basically I conclude that I think regulators should have the power um, on balance but that it should be used cautiously and we'll come to that, that's really the answer to the second question. But I, I look at those competing arguments and say well when you're talking about investors who've lost life savings, um, particularly as um, Often, in cases like that, they don't actually have the means of pursuing any compensation for themselves. And if you've got the regulator who is licensing these people to provide this advice and, or provide this service and then it all goes wrong, it is slightly different from your normal contractual disputes. Okay, anyway, so let's have a th move on and have a talk about the um, second question there, which is if we've decided yes to the first one, should the interests of investors prevail over the interests of other stakeholders? So in order to answer that question, I want to now turn to the third um, group that I'd identified as being um, a group that is impacted by decisions that are made by public regulators, and that is the public interest. So what we'll do is I'll outline what I mean by the public interest, and then I'll come back and answer that second question. All right. So. The public has a legitimate interest in the likely impact that enforcement action will have on the market. The public, the taxpayer, pays for these public regulators. Um, so simply from that fact alone, it gives the public generally the right to have an interest in the determinations that are made by public regulators. When they're deciding will they issue enforcement action and if they're going to, what type of enforcement action will they issue? Okay, so um, what we're really talking about here, um, well I'll just step back a bit and talk about the different types of enforcement actions that regulators can issue. We've already mentioned compensation and that's clearly going to be um, in the interests of the current investors who've lost money. They're really going to want to see the regulator take action that results in them getting compensation. But public regulators have a whole lot of other enforcement mechanisms that they can choose from. And um, in Australia, which is a regulator that I'm most familiar with, if there have been a breach of these market 
rules like um, uh, insider trading, misleading and deceptive conduct, failure to, to disclose information. There's a whole range of remedies that the regulator can seek. And they range from harsh criminal sanctions, which could result in individuals being sent to jail, um, civil actions, um, disqualification orders for directors and other officers, civil fines, criminal fines, um, all the way down to more persuasive enforcement techniques, such as um, an order that the company or the entity that's engaged in the misleading and deceptive conduct implements some sort of education or compliance program. So they can range from very severe right down to um, minor sort of persuasive enforcement mechanisms. Sometimes you can have um, severe penalties imposed that also include compensation and other times you can have minor penalties imposed that might also include a compensation order. So compensation may or may not be imposed at any <coughs> end of the spectrum. It would depend on how much compensation is ordered, whether you would consider it punitive or, um, or persuasive. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that public regulators have a whole range of enforcement mechanisms at their disposal. Only one of them is compensation and that can come in at any time. Okay, so what is the public interest in the enforcement mechanism that the regulator chooses? There is a public interest in that um, when we think about what the role of the regulator is. It's generally accepted that the role of public regulators in financial markets is to promote the integrity and stability of the financial market. That is the role of the regulator. Um, and the public has an interest in seeing that that is what happens. The public has an interest in seeing that the regulator acts in such a way as to promote the integrity of the market. And by that I really mean, I guess in this context, is that the regulator acts in a way that encourages the actors within the market to comply with the law. Okay, so that's what you want your public regulators to be doing. You want them to be exercising their enforcement functions and powers in a way that encourages maximum compliance. It's long been accepted that regulators cannot catch or detect, catch and enforce every single contravention of the law that comes before them. So if they can't do that, what you want them out there doing is acting in such a way that they're promoting people to comply voluntarily. And there's a lot of regulation literature that talks about how regulators can best do that. And it's not all about going in hard all the time and getting the maximum penalty and sending the greatest, strongest deterrent message. And it's also not all about going in leniently all the time and adopting a persuasive approach and um, requiring people to put in compli compliance or education programs. Regulation theory tells us that regulators deal with a vast range of corporate actors who are motivated by a whole lot of different factors to comply with the law and regulators have to respond to all those different factors and basically um, adopt what is called a responsive or strategic approach. And this theory, responsive regulation, was initially developed about 20 years ago by a couple of um, professors, Ayers and Braithwaite, and they argue, and this has been adopted and, and expanded um, over a number of years, that successful regulators will be regulators who can act strategically, who sometimes adopt a um, lenient approach and go in softly, sometimes adopt a punitive approach and go in hard, um, but always looking with a view to, in this circumstance, what is the best thing we can do to get the regulatory outcome we want and that regulatory outcome is in the future we want to reduce contraventions, increase compliance and therefore reduce future losses. So they're targeting or forward looking. They're looking to see what enforcement action can we take in this particular circumstance, will that give us our best regulatory outcome, will that mean that it is more likely than not that there will be less contraventions in the future. 
Sometimes that means we're going to go in really hard, we're going to try and send this person to jail, we're going to go for a maximum deterrent approach. We think in this circumstance that's going to get the best message out there. However, in this other circumstance we think that's not required for a variety of reasons. We think the best approach is that we should go leniently and um, we'll get the best outcome if we require this company to put in compliance policies and procedures or enter an enforceable undertaking of some sort. So the point is, regulatory theory says you don't concentrate on the current contravention, you don't concentrate on the current victims. The picture is much broader than that. It's important that regulators act in a way that promotes integrity of the market generally, not acts in a way that simply looks after the victims of the current contravention. So I think that's where the conflict arises that I talk about in this paper. Now there won't always be a conflict. Sometimes the regulator will determine that the best possible regulatory impact they can get out of this given situation is a large claim for compensation. They might be looking at sending a big deterrent message. They might say, well, in this case, we think um, that there's a, we, the best way of achieving that is to seek a whole lot of compensation and we'll give it to the investors. So that might be um, the, the approach that's adopted in that case. But that's not always going to be the case for various reasons. Um, it won't always be the case that the regulator will be able to get the regulatory impact they want from the particular action as well as gaining compensation for investors. So there will be situations where publicly funded regulators will have to sit down and determine um, what's the appropriate way to go in this circumstance. And those conflicts might arise for a variety of reasons and I've just put um, budgets and other constraints on the slide. So it might be one of those circumstances where they say, look, this is a bad breach there are investors who've lost a lot of money. It would be good if we could run this action, but we just don't have the funds. This might be one of the ones that never get run. Or we can run this action, but this was such a serious breach, we really want to make sure that the people involved in this never do this again. So we want to take enforcement action against them that it results in them either going to jail or being banned for a significant number of years. And so they'll target their enforcement at that and they might think, well, that's more important rather than getting compensation. Or they might, um, for other reasons, decide that, as I was saying before, for regulatory impact, that it's important that they go leniently in this case and they just, instead of going for compensation, they think it's more important in this case to um, have this company enter an enforceable undertaking which requires them to bring in compliance programs which will then hopefully result in less breaches, less victims in the future in that particular industry. So um, there are conflicts and there are situations where regulators have to make these determinations. So if we come back to what Warren said about fairness in this, um, in this sort of area, and he said, as I said before, fairness requires consideration be given to the perspectives of others who are impacted by our actions. When regulators are making these determinations, and particularly this conflict between the current victims who are out there screaming in the media saying how did ASIC or the regulator let this happen? They were supposed to be regulating this industry. They licensed this particular financial service provider who's now breached these provisions and I've lost all my money. Um, how do they um, balance those interests against the public interests? And so, as I said, if we look at what um, Warren said, they have to give consideration to the impact that their actions will have on those individuals and in particular when you're talking about these investors if it's their life savings, one of the things the regulator will be considering is whether or not um, the particular investors have any ability to take private enforcement action themselves. So that will be one of the things the regulator will consider. So the impact on the victims will be greater if there's no likelihood that they'll be able to take enforcement action and gain compensations themselves. So that might be a factor that the regulator will weigh up. But the regulator also has to look at the impact on the public. And if the regulator is convinced that from a market integrity perspective it is better to pursue some other type of enforcement action, 
it will be awfully hard for the regulator to say, well, we're not going to pursue that even though we think it's in the public interest. Um, if they believe that by not pursuing it, there's a likelihood um, or that they won't get the, the other the flow and effect of reduction in uh, future contraventions and future losses that they believe they would have if they pursued the public enforcement, sorry, the public interest enforcement option. So regulators faced with these type of decisions will have to, according to Warren, not they will have to, they should, from a fairness perspective, consider the impact of their decisions on the victims and also on the integrity of the market, that being the public interest. And then I argue in the um, book chapter that they should weigh these factors up and then determine, after they've considered it, the impact, make a determination. And I basically come down on the side of arguing that I think the public interest should prevail over the interests of current victims in situations where there is a real conflict. Because I say the role of a publicly funded regulator is to seek to, ins to ensure that there is integrity in the market and they should be forward looking and um, seeking hopefully to act in such a way that limits or reduces contraventions in the future and therefore reduces future losses. Now I don't think there's an easy answer to this um, and I don't think it's a straightforward answer but um, on balance I think the public interest should outweigh the interests of, of investors who've, who've lost as a result of a current contravention. So um, I've talked a little bit about ASIC, the Australian regulator, and um, it is a regulator that is faced with these types of decisions and its stated view, um, and I'll just read to you a quote from, from one of the ASIC commissioners, and which I think sort of sums up um, this conflict and also um, it's a view that I would support. But they say that ASIC's primary function is to regulate the equity capital markets in order to promote confidence and integrity that encourages both domestic and foreign investment. Where there has been a contravention of the Corporations Act and investors have suffered loss, ASIC's most direct concern is the regulatory effect on the market and action taken by ASIC is generally geared towards minimising these effects and preventing future occurrences. ASIC's primary concern is deterring future contraventions of the law and not seeking compensation on behalf of victims of the contravention. So that's their view and that's one that, um, that I would support as well. So um, this is just back to those two questions that I asked earlier on. I do think it's appropriate that publicly funded regulators have the power to seek compensation in appropriate cases. But I don't um, think that the interests of investors should prevail over other stakeholders, and in particular, um, the public interest in seeing a regulator take enforcement action that is designed to um, promote the integrity of the market generally. Another public interest thing that I haven't raised here, but which I think is important, is also the fact that breaches of these types of provisions um, often can impact much more widely than just on the investors who've suffered a loss. And we've seen that as a result of, you know, some of the fallout from the global financial crisis and things like that. It has much wider impact. And I think that's another argument for putting the public interest first over the interest of the investors who've lost as a result of the current contravention. And there are many jurisdictions that don't allow public regulators to seek compensation at all. So a lot of um, jurisdictions have stopped at the first question and said, no, we don't think that's appropriate anyway, so we don't give them the power. But certainly in Australia, the regulator does have it and it is something that the regulators had to think about. Um, and the regulator does say, and I agree with them, but that um, it shouldn't be their priority if there is a conflict. Yeah. Um, on the issue of compensation, like what would the role of like insurance be in this case? Because if you have like, say, d &O insurance, then really it makes no sense that they don't have d &O insurance if you're <coughs> making a a word for compensation basically would effectively have the shareholders paying themselves the compensation. Yeah. But if you have insurance, like I don't understand why what the harm would be in like pursuing compensation in a case where there is the special insurance because it would really be the insurance company paying out the compensation, the current sections anyway. Yeah, um, and I agree with you. I mean, I'm not saying there's harm in obtaining, if going for compensation. I agree that that should be available. And especially it makes sense, as you say, where there is D&O you know, insurance and you know then that, the, that there is the money there available to compensate the victims. 
but it's whether or not it's the publicly funded regulator's role, who's paid for by the taxpayer, to run that action. If the insurance is there, um, there's an argument for saying, well, the investors should perhaps um, run that action themselves. Um, or in, 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 to, in the second question, should that be the priority? If you're going to allow the regulator to run it, should that be the priority? And I don't think it is. I still think the priority should be, um, I'm not saying you should never run compensation claims, but I think the decision the regulator should make should be based on what's going to give them the best regulatory bang for their buck, rather than what's going to compensate the investors. Yeah. Yep. You raised um, a like, issue of compensation in the context of, so I'm just using this. Okay. <coughs> you raised like the issue of uh, compensation. No, it's, it yeah. still an employer right. voice, it's just um, important. In the context of like, the mom and pop who lost their life savings mm. and isn't able to sue mm. on their own. But how does that get in the way of, you know, a large mutual fund or an institutional investor who wish to seek private action? Yeah. I mean, is, is that better for a regulator to seek whatever compensation that they decide on a public policy basis versus allowing perhaps even shareholders to join in a larger, larger suit mm. and go for literally what is the best bang for their buck. Yeah. I think that the regulator should take into consideration when it's determining what it's going to do, the types of um, uh, investors that have lost money. And I certainly think it should be an even stronger reason for them not to seek compensation if you've got the type of investors that you're talking about who are capable of seeking their own action. So I think it's an argument um, another argument against regulators putting that interest over um, the regulatory impact interest. As a follow up to that, yep. um, like if you have a regulator who makes these decisions of whether to seek compensation or not, mm. it's so easy for that mom and pop to go in front of a TV and you know shed some tears mm. and outline their story and mm. the optics of refusing to seek compensation look mm. really bad. Yeah. Yeah. And we know regulators, even financial regulators that are supposed to be independent, can be swayed by these like mm. uh, public opinion. Mm. Mm. How do you shield a regulator like that? Oh, look, I don't know that you can. And I've certainly seen examples of that happening in Australia where there is a, a large media outcry and then it seems like to the outsider that the regulator changes their mind and does and pursues the compensation. I don't know, I mean, regulators are funded by the government and Certainly our regulator gets a lot of criticism, no matter what it does. It's criticised when it doesn't act. It's criticised when it, act, it acts and then loses cases. And you know, then it's criticised for acting when it shouldn't. Um, and it's criticised by investors, particularly on that basis of, you know, you licensed this particular person and you're supposed to be regulating them and now we've lost money because of it. And, and you do see that in front of the media. I'm not, I don't know how you shield regulators from that. Um, because they will then, not only is the media will target the politicians as well, who then place the pressure on the regulators who are paid by the, the government. So, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah, just uh, speaking to the... Uh, just speaking to the first question you yep. posed, and I think you mentioned earlier about the distinction between um, in, uh, private enforcement of a contract. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's sort of akin to when you have widespread losses, even if the company um, isn't bankrupt or insolvent, it's sort of the same idea that uh, when that kicks in, when there's widespread loss, mm. you want to sort of prevent each uh, in, in individual or each investor from enforcing their remedies piecemeal, um, you know, for the benefit of everybody. Mm. It, do you see it sort of akin to that or? Yeah, I do. Um, and it, that's sort of an argument that people run for having class actions, of course. It's, it's better to have the one class action. I, yeah, I can see an argument in favour of that as well. Um, maybe that's another justification as why why you would allow a regulator to do it. However, an alternative would be a class action. So if you had a whole lot of investors, um, they, even if they didn't want to pursue it privately, or there was a number of them and they put them together as a class, that would be another, another option. So yeah, but it, it is akin to that, yeah. And just one more question. You're talking about um, enforcement uh, in, when a director breaches a duty mm -hmm. and how that isn't uh, the case in several other jurisdictions, yep. such as our own. Um, do you find that that would be maybe an impediment or um, 
that a director would not want to be, um, or would she decline to take on a director role in Australia because of that, or does it not seem to have you know, such an impact? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I did a paper which was published last year with the girl from the Boston College Law School where we did a comparative piece on um, enforcement of directors' duties in Australia and the US. And we were basically arguing for a public enforcement model. Not for the compensation part of it, but I personally think that director disqualification orders are really powerful remedies. And there is, there's been a number of studies done in the US that have shown that a lot of the shareholder derivative suits are settled on the basis that the directors don't pay out of their own pockets. So their insurance pays or the company pays, whatever. Under Australian, the Australian system, um, directors face much more stringent liabilities. And we have, I mean, these cases aren't run all the time because they're big cases and they're really strongly fought by directors. But we have had some permanent disqualification orders imposed for breach of duty. To answer your question, there was a survey done by the Australian Institute of Company Directors where they asked directors whether or not they thought the liability was too high in Australia, and of course they all said yes. And whether or not they had declined from taking on directorships because of the risk of liability, and a lot of them said yes. But most of the risks they identified were not director's duty breaches. They were things like occupational health and safety type things is what they were really concerned about. But the thing that I found the most interesting about that survey is they set out the characteristics of the directors who were surveyed, and I can't remember the exact figures, but a large proportion of them were directors on five or more companies. So yes, they're concerned. Yes, they say they might knock back a directorship here and there, but it's not stopping them being directors altogether. And they're also happy to be directors for five years, you know, on, sorry, on five different companies at once. So, I don't know. There is that argument that's often run in the literature that if you make the liability on directors too stringent, you won't get good people being directors. We've got plenty of good people being directors in Australia. But it, yeah, I don't know. And it, yes, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. 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 yeah so I, yes, I don't need a microphone. You can hear me, right? No, it's, it's pretty good. Wait, we're recording. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, just a general comment. Um, I was just thinking, I see a, a general problem in everything that is related to public financing or funding of, of investors. So wouldn't that actually change the behavior of the investors if they can anticipate that there will be public funding available? I see this uh, as a problem that is very similar to a bailing out of companies, yeah. which is another topic. So I think that will just lead to another problem. We think that we have solved the problem when we publicly fund the, com uh, mm. the investors, mm. but we actually go to another problem that is that investors start to anticipate this public funding, yeah. then we have another problem actually, are not solving anything, but yeah. possibly creating another incentive problem. Yeah, um, that, I'm glad you raised that because I meant to mention that and I forgot. But another um, problem with this is, in the beginning I was talking about investors' expectation that the public regulator will act on their behalf. The Problem is if you have some cases run where the regulator seeks compensation, you then create this perception in the minds of some investors, and it's probably your mum and... Expectations. Yeah, expectation. Look, I can invest in this. This company has been approved by ASIC. Um, if everything goes wrong, that's okay. The regulator will step in and take enforcement action and get compensation for me. And I think that is a real issue. Um, and I think going back to my first question that I said yes, and I forgot to mention this, but I would say yes, providing that, regulators make their enforcement policies and practices known and that investors are aware that yes the regulator has power to take a compensation proceedings on my behalf but that in the vast majority of cases that's not going to happen because there's just not enough money to do it and it's also not the priority of the regulator so i do think that that's important thing that you've raised i think that is a real issue yep oh sorry there's one at the back of the mic <laughs> you've got the mic <laughs> sure um, I, uh, uh, so you mentioned something earlier that kind of grabbed my attention, which is this idea that uh, we, you know the regulars are working off of limited resources, and because they're working off limited resources, they have to go after the big fish, and that's sort of it. And it started making me think about the idea of what happened in, or one of the leading theories of how crime got saw, or reduced in New York in the 80s and 90s, which was by going after the, the little guy, essentially, which was the, the people who ran the turnstiles uh, 
find them right away, get them off the streets. If the subways uh, were hit with uh, spray paint, clean them up before they get back on the street the next day. And I'm curious if there are any jurisdictions who have taken a different approach as opposed to going after the big fish mm -hmm. to actually go after all of the little ones and if they've had any uh, success in, in doing so. Um, not that I can actually quote for you, but I, I do think most regulators adopt a mixed approach so that they would also consider that there are merits in going after the little fish. And um, a lot of regulatory actions are actually run at a much lower level. Um, if you look at most regulator statistics, the big costly enforcement actions like your big civil cases where you, in Australia where you direct us duty civil cases, there will only be a few of them. There'll be even less sort of criminal, high profile criminal trials. A lot of the enforcement action takes place at the lower level um, where you're looking at persuasive techniques. Going in and speaking to companies and saying, look, we know you've done the wrong thing, but if you enter into this enforceable agreement with us whereby you put in place um, these sort of compliance programs, there's a lot more of those types of actions. They don't get the same publicity. Um, the big ones do. So I'm probably not answering your question, but the regulators will run small actions and maybe a lot of them are targeted at your little fish. But your big high profile cases, um, I haven't done the statistics on it, but a lot of them are run against people who already had a public profile. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I think that's a generally, in regulatory theory, you, people say you've got to be doing a whole lot of different things to get success. You don't just target one area and you don't just target one sort of type of crime. So uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I just was uh, pertaining to the comment about how the idea that publicly funded regulators seeking compensation might encourage this attitude where investors expect it or anticipate it and, and that being a real issue to deal with. I think, uh, I, I'm not sure how that's contrary to the public interest if the regulator's mandate is to uh, inspire investor confidence and encourage investment in the first place. It sounds like the, 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 the goal um, indirectly of, of compensating investors might in fact serve their public interest goal, which is to do exactly that, to inspire investor confidence. So I, I don't see how those, those goals are in conflict and how that's an issue. Yeah, um, I guess in answer to that I would say a goal of getting people to invest their money in the market is different, I think, to a goal of trying to promote or encourage people to comply with the law when they're running the markets. Um, and as I said, I don't think there's, I mean, in many situations there won't be a conflict. In many situations, whatever the regulator does can serve both functions. And a large compensation claim, as I said before, could reassure investors, could encourage other people to invest in the market and could send a strong deterrent message and achieve the same regulatory goals. But it's in those circumstances where the regulator, for whatever reason, can't do that and has to choose between compensation or running a criminal trial um, or a situation where they say, look, we really think we're going to get the best regulatory impact um, by getting a compliance program in place with this company rather than hitting them with a big compensation claim. Um, then I think if, if the regulator's convinced and it's a sound decision that that's going to give them a better regulatory outcome, then I would argue that the compensation should, should not be their focus. Um, but I do take your point that often there can be this overlap um, and end, in, um, you know, by... <laughs> Although I think you're better off promoting investor com confidence by acting in a way that means there are less breaches in the future and less losses, rather than promoting confidence in that if there is a loss, the regulator will step in and get the compensation for you. I think that's really what I'm saying, right. yeah. Uh, just, just to follow up though, yep. couldn't, um, I, I presume when you're seeking compensation, you're seeking it from those who, who would breach and you'd otherwise uh, seek a criminal yep. sanction again, so couldn't that equally serve as a deterrent? It wouldn't, wouldn't potentially they be more concerned about losing all their ill-gotten gains than going to jail for six months? <coughs> well, it depends how long the jail term is and, right, how, and yeah. how big the gains were, I suppose. Um, yeah, I don't know, and, and it gets on the individual as well. But I would think that it would be generally acceptable that people would rather not go to jail. Um, I would have thought, most people, but probably not in every case. <laughs>
Yeah. And the other thing too is one of the penalties that the regulator could seek could be a banning or a disqualification order. So if this person who's done the wrong thing, the regulator really wants to get them out of the market and stop them um, engaging in this conduct in the future, that might be the focus of the regulatory action. Yep. That doesn't mean you can't also have a compensation claim. So sometimes you can have both, but I'm just talking about the situations when you can't, and they do arise. Yep. Hey there, um, I just Anyone had a question. Need the microphone or? Oh, oh, sorry, no apologies. Sorry. Um, so we're reading a book right now on um, the whistleblower for the Bernard Madoff uh, fraud. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question is, throughout the book we see the SEC presented with you know information over a lot of years. And it really, from the time they were given the, the information to the time you know things fell apart, it was maybe like a $50 billion difference. So mm -hmm. I wondered your thoughts on um, a regulator seeking compensation for investors where it seems like they themselves might have been negligent, and also how you think investors would feel about um, a, regula a regulator seeking compensation on their behalf when they themselves may have allowed the fraud to get bigger than it otherwise would have been. I think that's an, a stronger argument in favour of compensation, I, I think. Um, if, if, I mean, it's a difference between saying ASICs license this financial service provider and then they, the financial service provider has done something wrong. That's, and then arguing that ASIC therefore should seek compensation. I think that's different to what you're saying when the regulator has actually been, may have been negligent and that's resulted in a multiplication of the effect. Um, I still don't know though whether I would then say that they shouldn't pursue other regulatory options instead. If, if a choice has to be made, whether that would still be enough to override the need to protect the public interest. Um, but I certainly think it's a stronger argument um, for the compensation claim. Yep. Um, this year, sorry, um, last year in Ontario, um, people who were trying to do a class action suit for misrepresentation in uh, secondary markets were denied because of their limitation period mm. had passed. But the judge there, I think he was so appalled by this that he had no discretion that he ran through the whole analysis. Mm. Um, if your rationale for compensation by public regulators is the protection of markets, and it's not just comp compensation in and of itself, mm -hmm. then should they be free from statute of limitation regimes or like such regulations? Because um, if, if you find out something <coughs> went wrong yeah. four years ago, yeah. well, in a private action, you'd be barred. I mean, yeah. there's arguments around it, but you'd be barred from pursuing, uh, the little guy here couldn't get into a class action because he couldn't have it certified, right. at least in Ontario law anyway. Mm. But, if your justification for compensation is sending a deterrent message to raise confidence in the public market, mm. shouldn't they be able to use that tool to go after them? Uh, um, that's a hard question. I, look, I don't really know what the answer to that is. Um, I guess you've got to have some controls on regulators. You can't just give them, you know, the right to 20 years down the track suddenly pursue an action. So I think. I would say that if there was some justifiable reason why they hadn't or they didn't have the information or they couldn't do it, well then maybe, but yeah, I don't really know all that much about it. Um, uh, it's a good question and comment on the relationship between public and private yeah. enforcement. So yeah. To the extent that we allow um, and want public regulators to be involved in you know, um, getting compensation for investors, then what's the implications? Um, for class actions and for class actions lawyers and for investors using the private litigation route and what are the opportunities for you know, um, uh, kind of different frameworks that might you know, create loopholes or just create kind of policy issues that we need to address. And so it'll be a conversation that will continue on this afternoon but also next week when we speak about private enforcement and kind of what the framework there and one of the limitation period uh, issues is a significant one at the moment. So. Why don't we take this opportunity to thank Dr. Welsh um, for uh, spending the time with us to share, you know, her perspectives on these really important issues, and they're very, you know, relevant and timely in terms of what we're what we're examining here. So thank you again. Thank you.